between mountains and seas, your children salute you till the land of the free land of Guyana, our heroes of your both ones men and free lay their bones on your shore this soil so they hallowed and from them are we all sons Good night to our viewers, good night to our special guests tonight. Uh, just before we start tonight's program, we give credit to Globe Stand team, to Omar, Omar, Devin, and all the people working hard behind the scenes to make tonight's program available. And to our viewers out there, to our sponsors, to our well wishers, if you would like uh, the, if you like this or other Globespan programs, be, feel, please feel free to join us, advertise with us, or sponsor various programs by contacting us at sales at globespan247.com. Viewers, tonight we're going to look at a big topic, one that has accompanied Guyana's history with a forceful consistency, its corruption. This word and its varied meanings and forms have taken control of our lives in one way or another. Corruption has been the platform on which many have won and lost political power, and it certainly contributed to the loss of power for the PPP in 2015. In the years 2013 to 2015, I myself have posted a number of articles and opinions on corruption in Guyana, and I joined in opposing the then PPP government uh, in corruption that was espoused by the mannerisms and attitudes of the then government. I, too, had shared numerous opinions on various deals on cronyism and nepotism and other forms of corruption. And I, too, have faced my share of attacks from the last government and uh, many others in government, including persons in the highest office. Those of us who chose to remain independent of political patronage have a very different and independent view of the performances of various governments. While some people may see corruption as an easy way to getting things done, the long-term cost of corruption on any nation is greater than the sum of monies involved in the corrupt schemes themselves. In a paper on corruption and the global economy, the, global, the National Bureau of Economic Research noted that corruption may be highly correlated with poor quality of public servants and poor quality of infrastructural development. Corruption is a symptom of the government that is malfunctioning in many ways. And evidence from research in Uganda suggests that corruption retards development even more than taxation does. The IMF noted in its series, Why Worry About Corruption, that corruption distorts the composition of government and it distorts the composition of government expenditure, leading to lower quality of infrastructural works and public service. From our independence to now, corruption has been a pervasive issue dogging the various governments that sought to govern or to dictate our livelihood. From independence to now, many of us have watched with dismay the allegations of corruption in one form or another from one government to another. One can list a plethora of corrupt deals of various governments. There was the GEC power bars fiasco of the PNC government, the Demerara Woods scandal, the sale of telecoms that took place in the period after elections was due, the CARICOM rice mill deals and a whole set of others. Then there was the PPP days, the lethem fiber optic cable, the radio station cronyism, the abuse of Guy Suku's management houses and its annex, and in fact, the highest rating that we achieve, and mind you, this is all negative, that is, we achieved the highest on corruption's perception index during the PPP's last government. And then there is the current day government, 
with corruption concerns surrounding airport contracts, drug bond fiasco, land grab after the NCM, security cameras contract, Durban Park matters, and much more. The current government, however, whenever tasked with accusations of corruption, shapes its argument by referring us to look what the PPP did. It is as if we have come down to a time in our history when we are saying to the people out there to decide which set of corrupt politicians they want and maybe just make your decisions based on race or something else. So the question we have to ask, is there a reality to this corruption? Is there a perception only to it? Are all corrupt? Is there hope? Or is there a different side to the many things we see and hear every day? For example, is there another side to the drugs bond fiasco of the current government? I certainly want to know. What about the airport contracts? We must therefore openly dissect this thing called corruption, and we must do so by looking at the main political players, the PPP, the PNC, the AFC, etc. While Soku and Sara and other judicial and subjudicial body may have been successful, or may have failed in their prosecution and so-called persecution attempts, the perception of people is the true litmus test for the corrupt. So where are we heading? Can we hope that those parties contesting the 2020 general elections can bring us some decency at ease where corruption is concerned? Globespan is hoping to start this series of open discussion on corruption, and we are inviting the government to sit with us in our hot seat to discuss corruption, as we have also invited the opposition. And here tonight, we have a gentleman who is no stranger to being in the hot seat. He is a man who, despite his seniority in his professional and political life, remains uniquely a humble and approachable person. In fact, he was one of the few, very few persons who under the PPP rule could have been approached by anyone at any time dis to discuss matters of corruption under the PPP. Mr. Mahabir Anil Anandalal is no stranger to Guyanese at home and abroad. Anil, welcome to our program. Thank you very much, Yog, and good evening to your viewers. Thank you, and before we get started, uh, uh, and I, you know, I've, I've addressed all my uh, male uh, guests as brothers. So before we get started, Brother Anil, um, you have been part of a government that lost power in 2015. And corruption aside, even though addended to, there has been a number of aspersions cast on your character. As we all know, untruths are consistently and constantly rewritten to create newer perceptions. Character assassination is pro probably the easiest thing to accomplish. So before we get into the discussion on corruption, if you don't mind, I would like to ask you, to, I know you have made public comments already about all of these issues, but I would like if you could hark us back to two matters that I see edging itself into public domain constantly. One is the Courtney Crumbing issue, and the second is the law books issue. So if you don't mind, uh, my brother, before we get into the discussion on corruption itself, let's give us a little bit of your take and your standing on the Courtney Crumbing issue and the law books issue. First of all, um, you, I'm, I'm glad that you asked me those questions because um, I, I want to speak on them as much as possible. Now, I have been in public life for quite a while. I was elected to parliament in 2006 and served until 2011, and then I was appointed Attorney General by President Ramotar, and I served in that capacity. Before that, I functioned as an attorney at law for over 20, 20 something years, um, well known in Guyana, and not a single allegation of wrongdoing has ever been made against me prior to me getting into government. Not a single allegation of any type even as a boy growing up in the villages on the East Coast, where I grew up, not a single allegation of wrongdoing of any type ever made against me. Then I entered governmental life. As Attorney General, I, as the situation unfolded, we had a minority government uh, trying to run the country in a hostile parliament, can't pass any laws, Budgets being cut, 
um, spendings, public expenditures being um, cut, legislation being rejected. Naturally, the platform was set for the Attorney General at the time to play a leading role in the defense of the government. And my role began to be played on that platform. And I eventually became one of the chief architects or defenders of the government. In Guyana, a lot of things are shaped by politics. So naturally, I became the focal point of the opposition or one of the focal points of the opposition. And the, there was that Kaicho News tape fiasco when I was having a conversation with Leonard Gildari, who without my permission taped me and made it public. Now, I am having a private conversation with somebody who I consider to be confidential and my friend at the time. That person taped me and made the conversation public. That conversation was not intended for public consumption. So people invaded my privacy, listened to my private conversation, and I became the villain. I have said to people over and over again, if many of the, those who condemned me, if their private conversations were ever aired, they would never be able to face society again. I have survived. I am here. And I'm talking to you about it. That by itself is something. But let me move beyond that. Crummy Wing became a protester. They said he was paid by the Kaicho News, I'm not sure, to protest in front of my ministry. He protested there for nearly a month or two months, I can't remember. Not one incident was there reported or known of me interfering with Crummy Wing's right to protest, me calling the police on him, me trying to get him to stop protesting, not at all. No allegation was ever made. He protested when he got tired, he stopped protesting. Two months after that, as we were approaching the 2015 election, two or three months, I can't remember. I remember that I was speaking at a public meeting at Timeri on the East Bank of Demerara, and on my way back, I received a phone call that Crummy Wing was shot somewhere in Diamond. And that is all that I know. That is all that I know. I remembered the police commissioner at the time. I was one of the few ministers who never had a, a, a security guard at my house. I never had a bodyguard accompanying me anywhere. The then police commissioner came and met with me and said, look, you should get guards at your home like all the other ministers, and you should get a personal bodyguard. And someone recommended a bodyguard to me. He was an enforcement officer from customs. And that person worked with me for two weeks. And I, I can remember that the, I think the, the, uh, the allegation started to connect me, the, the PNC, I suppose, the political actors of the time, started to connect me with Krami Wing, I suppose, because of his um, protestations in front of my ministry. And that is all I know of the gentleman. I have said over and over to this government, they control the police force, they control the machineries of government, they are holding COIs into traffic accidents. And if this is such a burning issue to them, then hold a COI into this. I know, I know that the police at the time had evidence in terms of the phone call that was last received on Krami Wing's number, I know that the police was able to trace the location where the call came from. And it came from the vicinity of Sapphire. And then that phone was traced somewhere to Mark Letem. And then it disappeared. That was the end of the investigation. That's all I know. So you're making you're making a public call for a COI on Courtney Krami Wing's uh, uh, murder. But I've said that, I posted it on my Facebook page right. how many years ago. I said it on a Kaicho news radio with a very Gildari guy um, when he interviewed me quite recently. Correct. And I, 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 uh, I welcome Good. such an inquiry. Good. Let, let, let's move to the uh, other one. Yes, go on. just, There was nothing there. They, they want to put Tommy Wing's killing as a political killing. 
Let me say at this point in time, any objective, sensible analyst examining the situation at the time, the political climate at the time, would recognize quite quickly that it would never have been in the interest of the PPP to engineer such a thing. And in any event, we don't have a history of doing that. We had the killing of Father Dark, we had the assassination of Walter Rodney, we have political assassinations, and there are history of empirical data connecting those assassinations, politically driven violence to a political party. And that is the reality of the political landscape of Guyana. Good. Well, yes, thank, you, right. thank you for clearing that up. Let's move quickly to the second issue. We're not, I, I know you have also spoken publicly about, about it, but it, it's something personal to you in terms of your name would have been called a law books issue. Now, Yog, as I said, the Attorney General, as you know, from the time we left government, he has been my focus as I am parliamentary and politically required to do focus my attention on his stewardship of the legal sector in government because that is the responsibility assigned to me by the opposition leader. And I have been doing that and I've been doing that publicly and I've been doing that in the courts and I've been challenging this guy right through. He spoke to me and told me that unless I back off, basically, that he will have to deal with me personally. And I said, I have nothing to hide. I have no skeleton in my closet. Go ahead, do what you gotta do. Then came this, this law book. This was a journal, a book that I was subscribing to 15 years prior to my appointment to office. The only thing that I asked President Ramatar when we were discussing terms and conditions of service. I never asked what my salary was. I said, Mr. President, I am subscribing to some books and all I want is that the subscription to be continued to be paid by the government. At that time, subscriptions were being paid by the government of Guyana for Ministry of Agriculture employees, for Ministry of Health employees with journals, Ministry of Finance employees, so it was a regular facility in government. Okay. There was no need to put it in writing or anything. Correct. And the ministry started to pay for the books. Mm -hmm. When this thing became an issue, and the police started to investigate, etc., so cool, I went to Mr. Sidney James. I attended his office. I said, look, I am ordering a brand new, complete volumes of these books from the publishers. And I am going to deliver it to you for you to take to the Attorney General office. But, but the books that I have are my books. They are marked with my name. They have my underlining. I've been using them in research. They have markings and so on. And up to today, you, I have in sealed plastic the 14 books shipped by DHL from London, from the publisher's Nexus Lexis, sealed in plastic to be handed over to the government or to whoever, whoever wanted. But, and I asked Mr. James, I said, in light of us going on ahead with the investigation, I am telling you that I have the books. I am buying a new set of books for you. Take it and let us leave the matter there. You know, he told me, he asked me to step outside of his office. He needed to make a phone call. He made a phone call. He called me back into his office and said, his instructions are that I must be charged. Okay. Understood. Right? So the books are valued, I don't know, less than $2,000. Mm -hmm. But they want something over me. Right. I have that. But that will never affect me from doing what I got to do for my party and for the people of this country. Great. Well, thanks for clearing that up. Now, Anil, you have been in public life for a long time. Um, let us, uh, you know, I mean, uh, one of the things we do know is that, uh, you know, there are many persons within the, the, the government circles and within opposition circles 
your names are known throughout this country and, and a lot of politicians are very respected regardless of the bile regardless of the hate that might be spewing out there in, in political season there is there is a great uh, deal of respect for a number of names and yours certainly is one that i believe a lot of persons respect uh, you know not just in guyana but out there too now i would like us to to get into our discussion on corruption this whole issue of corruption in government um, and, and if we can, uh, through your lead, if we can separate our discussions into a couple of segments. In my opening, I refer to the, the PNC days, the, 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 the Burnham and the Hoyt era, the GEC power bars fiasco, the, the, the uh, Burma rice mill issue and, and all of that thing. So I would like if we could look at the, the corruption because I want to come hard at you. I have some questions for you about the corruption on the PNC, but I would like us to assess all from, from independence to now. Take us in, into your journey. Let us look from independence to 1992. That is the pre-PPP, post-independence period, independence period. What remnant, if evidence of corruption, were there when the PPP got into office? And what did the PPP do to correct and then to seize and desist any recurrence? Now, many people don't like to assess the past, but history teaches us an important lessons and guides us via its trend as to what these players and which party, what will, it will do in the future. So take us through your experience from the PPP's perspective of, of pre-1992. All right, thank you, Yog. And um, I'm, I'm glad that you have situated uh, the discussion in those historical epoch, if we may use that term a little loosely. Now, you would appreciate that the corruption narrative and corruption as a phenomenon does not and never exist in vacuum. It exists in a context. And therefore, in examining the concept of corruption, one must also examine the context and the atmosphere that allow for corruption to grow or for it to be decimated. So let's start with the PNC. No one, I believe, at this point in time would dispute that from 1968 to 1985, all of the elections were massively rigged, that we had a political dictatorship in place, that opposition politicians had to be very careful, that there was a high degree of non-tolerance to political opposition, that there was no freedom of the press. In fact, there was no press. The press was controlled centrally by the government. At that time, the, in the late early 80s, you had the state controlling the commanding heights of the economy. So 80% of employed Guyanese were essentially employed by the state. And if you do, you had the issue of party paramountcy prevailing. So if you do not subscribe to the political party in power, then it means that you are not subscribing, you are not loyal to the government. Because paramount of the party meant that. The party was paramount and the government was subservient and subject to the party. So was the judiciary, so was every other institution of the state. In fact, you had a ministry of national mobilization and that ministry was the ministry that was the conduit from the public treasury funds going through that ministry and that ministry channeling the funds into Congress place. And that is how you had public expenditures being done. For 10 years, from 1982 to 1992, there were no audited records, no audited statements of the accounts of this country. None. So no one knew how much tax was collected, how much revenue was received, how much money was being spent, uh, spent on health, how much was spent on infrastructure. There was no known form of public procurement of any type or public tendering. 
And you would know that you, you grew up in Barbies, you see a road being done. You don't know who is the contractor. You don't know how he got the contract. You don't know what it cost. You don't know what public procurement or process he went through to be awarded that contract. Those things were not even known. Guyanese as a people did not even know that they were entitled to that kind of information. There was only one source that we could have gotten information from. And that is the state media, which was controlled by the political party of the day, the government governing party. The Auditor General, at that time, the Auditor General office was a small department of the Ministry of Finance. The then Auditor General, the last Auditor General under the PNC government, Anangul Sarani, is still around. He has memos that he will show you, sent to him by then Minister Carl Greenwich, instructing him not to audit certain government agencies. I give you those backdrop of the political accounting architecture to, to, for you to have an understanding of the people out there who are listening to me, to have an understanding what existed at the time. So you couldn't measure um, you, you couldn't measure what was the income flowing, you couldn't measure expenditure, you, you had no way of, of assessing the level of corruption. What you know, and uh, what I know, is that people who we know, hundreds of thousands of them, never got a contract in their life, never got close to getting a contract. A few people were getting the contracts, and no one knows how. Now let's get into the Hoyt era now, because the Hoyt era had some silver lining on it. Because when Hoyt took over, the country was bankrupt, and there was economic and financial crisis. So President Hoyt had no alternative but to rush to the IMF. When the IMF did an examination, of the state apparatus, the IMF issued an immediate cease order against public funding of certain institutions and gave Mr. Hoyt certain directives, disposed of them. They were burdens on the backs of the people. So Mr. Hoyt, with no system in place, no guidelines for procurement, no white paper, nothing, no consultation with the opposition, Consultation with the opposition at the time was an unheard of thing. Unheard of. So in a unilateral path, Mr. Hoyt began to dispose of millions and millions of dollars of state assets for next to nothing. And let me give you some of them, the statistics. Let us take the Marara Woods. You spoke about that. It was sold for 9.7 million pounds. In 1991, by and, and and it was also there were about 1.1 million of rainforest that was leased with it. 9.1 pounds. Six months later, the person who bought it, Lord Beaverbrook, Beaverbrook. sold it back for 61. He sold a part of it for 61 million pounds just six months after. At that time, he did not even pay off the guy in the government. And within another year, it was sold, it was valued. It was valued at 160 million to 206 million US dollars. That's the Amorara Timbers. Guyana, Guyana Timbers now. 130 million US dollars. That was the book value. It was sold for 23 million. With all fees and taxes waived. So 130 million the value sold for 23 million. Of course, no tendering, no public process. The paying company was sold to overseas Chinese for 1.15 million US. And it was valued millions of dollars. The rice complexes, they were valued for three, 
They were sold for 3.8 million, but valued 14 million US. And you know who signed the agreements of sale? Mr. Hyde's secretary. The telephone company, the telephone company perhaps was the worst. It was sold for 16.5 million. And they had 10 million US in the bank and in receivables. And the company was making a profit of two to four million annually. In one year, the telephone company, ATM, paid back for the company. And I have a whole list of them here. Absolutely not a single one went to procurement. So, so, so yes. So that, in a nutshell, mm -hmm. was what existed in Guyana when we took over, when the PVP took over. Right. So so getting into office, you inherited, you're saying that the PPP would have in, inherited not only uh, many corrupt deals, but but uh, it was like taps were open that you could not have stopped because the telecoms contract is still ongoing. Lord Beaverbrook or whatever the guy's name is, that was a done deal. You couldn't have changed it. But I am mindful of I can't remember the name, but I'm mindful of a more recent oil contract which I think under the PPP, and we'll, we'll get to it, which under the PPP government, I believe it was, that um, uh, immediately was resold for, for a multiple of its value. But we'll get to it in our next segment. Okay. But, but tell us quickly, so, so you inherited these. What uh, measures did the PPP put in place? All right. <laughs> because when you so came in, it was the Jagan era. So one of the first things that the Jagan government did was to lay a white paper in Parliament, setting out a procedure that the 92 government, the PUP government of that period, will follow when it comes to the disposal of state assets. And that paper was laid in the Parliament and unanimously approved. Firstly, two agencies alone were made responsible for the disposal of state assets, the privatization unit and NISIL, a government owned com company. NISIL was comprised of members of the government, members of the opposition, the labor movement, and persons re um, represent the private sector and persons representing consumers. So it was a broad based board governing the operations of NISIL. The procedure that was agreed upon contained in that white paper was that all assets to be sold would be publicly advertised. There would be um, invitation of bids, competitive bidding, and would be sold to the highest bidder. Everything will be documented. Or if there are exceptions, there must be good and proper reasons for exceptions. And every and periodic disclosures are to be made of these transactions at regular intervals. And these entities would be audited and we restore, first of all, let me pause here to emphasize that we restored public auditing by an independent auditor general after 10 years of absence. We restored that in 1992. And these bodies, the privatization unit and the sale, were subject to be audited by the, by, the, by the Auditor General or by entities, accounting and auditors approved by the Auditor General. And their annual reports were laid to the National Assembly. Right? So that's procurement. Right. Now, the sale, and over the years, Brassington has been there for a long time, and even before Brassington. There are booklets upon booklets which have been made public by Brassington and Nissil, outlining the transaction of all the assets that have been sold, who bid for them, the value of the bid, the price they sold at, the date that the advertisements were placed in the newspapers or wherever they were advertised. Those are documents that are there Correct. in relation to every transaction. All right? Then we had the Auditor General. As I said, we put that in place. 
And we, every state agency and every government organization funded with taxpayers' money were by law to be audited by the Auditor General. We put in place a brand new Audit Act, modern. We invested the Audit Office, we made it separate from government and made it an agency of state with its autonomy. We gave the staff of the Audit Office independence, functional independence. They were not public servants, they were like, they, they had security of tenure. The right. Auditor General had security of tenure like a judge. And they were, and the report was sent to a public accounts committee of the National Assembly that we resuscitated, chaired by an opposition. Right. So, so a number of measures were put into place by the, the Jagan era, the Jagan government. And I think that there's a lot of perception out there that probably the most decent period of our history would have been the Jagan era, which was a very short spell. Yeah, you wanted to... Yeah, I, I'm getting, I, I started a Jagan because he was the first. Correct. But these were ongoing developments. Got you. And while they started in 1992, they progressively became more and more institutionalized and more expansive. For example, right. in 2000, we passed a modern procurement act. Right. At that time, that was the most modern procurement act in the Caribbean. But now, so let, 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 me, let me interject a little bit. We want to go on a couple of seconds break, but I want to just break the program here um, because there are a couple of things that I want to get to. One is let's come to the post uh, the post PNC era for a discussion on its own. Um, and I want to I want to look at because many of the measures you would have put in place, people are saying, well, then that also became abused in the later years, which we will assess. I mean, there are things so much things that we can ask you about. But let, let's take a couple seconds break, Devin. Let's go to a, one of our advertisers. And when we come back, we're going to look at the post Jagan era, what happened from then to current day. The book launch of Jung Bahadur Singh of Guyana by Dr. Beter M. Ramrak will be held on Saturday, November 23rd at 5 p.m. at Tulsi Mandir. This book dives into the life of Jung Bahadur Singh, a prominent leader and mediator who assisted the sugar workers in their dispute with management. This book would examine the legacy of Jung Bahadur Singh as well as his contentious relationship with Chetty Jagan. Support the book launch on Saturday, November 23rd at 5 p.m. at 10324 111th Street, Richmond Hill, New York. Again, that's Saturday, November 23rd at 5 p.m. at Tulsi Mandir. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, a couple of things that, that we, we need to ensure that we get down for the records here. So we have looked at, at the, 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 the whole evidences and the remnants of corruption from the pre-1992 era. We mentioned that the, the post-1992 era, which was the Jagan era, a very short spell in which a number of measures were, were put in place. And uh, that included revamping the, the audit office, revamping a number of independent bodies to ensure that public accountability became the number one uh, cause for parliament and for lawmakers and so forth. Now, the post-Jagan era. Let me preface our discussions here, Anil, by quoting Basil Williams, who said, and it's on today's, if you go check Washington Post, Basil Williams has said that the administration, he's referring to the Green's administration, the administration, I quote, embarked on a very strong anti-corruption drive. When we took over, we inherited massive corruption. And in his, uh, in his probably interview, he addressed the PPP as left wing and said that you all, and that's you, the PPP, you all, quote, just took care of family, close friends and cronies and really impoverished the people, unquote. With that backdrop of the current Attorney General of Guyana making statements to the Washington Post that is published now, um, I would like us to now do an assessment of the post-Jagan era 
Um, and in, in that assessment, let us talk about a number of things, Anil. I'm going to let you take the lead here before I come to my questions per se. But take us through from the 1992, because as you know, corruption was one of the, the hot topics out there that many people believe, I certainly believe, led to the, led to, to the loss of the um, um, government by the PUP. Now, all right. So I was, I was, I was speaking about a, a transit, a process that commenced then, but that continued. For example, we had legislative changes, all ensured to establish institutions, institutional framework to avoid to diminish possibilities of corruption and non-accountability. I was speaking about the Procurement Act, for example, right? Mm -hmm. right? That removed the role of cabinet. At that time when that act was passed in 2000, cabinets across the Caribbean were actually awarding contracts. And here it is that this act, we set up a board, a tendering board presided over by a CEO. And bids were to be published by that, contracts are to be awarded by that body and come to cabinet only for a non-approval, a non-objection. All the bids were advertised. You had to make your application. There was an engineer estimate. You make your, your, your submission of a bid. You go there, it is assessed by an evaluation committee that drawn from the public service, mm -hmm. not from Freedom House. And those were the evaluators. And they are given criteria. The criteria are known. And they assess contract based upon that. And there is a, op there is a public opening of the bids and the announcement of who win and so on is a public process. And that was the process that governed public procurement in Guyana for, for 20 or how many years under the PUP. Now, look at what we did in terms of parliament, because if you, give, if you open your government to scrutiny, then one would assume that there would be less opportunities for corruption. We established, apart from the Public Accounts Committee, First of all, we resuscitated the entire committee system in the parliament, which was dead. We had, through the constitutional reform process, we had a revamped parliament with an active and vibrant committee system where the opposition played a significant role. In fact, the opposition used to chair most of these committees. These committees had oversight over different functions of government. So the Public Accounts Committee dealt with public accounts and all, the, 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 all that goes with it. And it was chaired by an opposition member. They had power, as all the other committees, to summon before them ministers and every public, any public officer to answer any question in relation to the expenditure of funds or in relation to the award of contracts or in relation to the performance of a function. You had sectoral committees. So you had the social service committee, you had the um, natural resources committee, and they were all chaired by opposition members and ministers were to go there and to account and, 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 and public officers for their functions. So you had that put into place and institutionalized. Then you had, um, what else you had? You, you, they were so, I, I can't remember all the things that were put into place, but at every level, there were mechanisms that were put in, oh, we had a, the Fiscal Management and Accountability Act that revolutionized budgeting in the country. You had agency budgeting and a level, layers and layers of built-in accountability to get, to ensure that the, pub, the, pub, the public purse is uh, uh, scrutinized at different level. Mm -hmm. And there were penalties for public officers who deviated from those institutional mechanisms. Right. But he, so, so I don't think that the PPP can be faulted for putting institutional network and framework in place in, to avoid, to get public accountability and to avoid corruption. I don't think we can be faulted. Whether we were able to achieve the objectives, that is a different matter. Correct. But in terms of making efforts, I think that we, would, we should be recognized as a government that did a lot 
having regard to where we came from, to put things in place to ensure that they were great amount of accountability in Guyana for the first time, having regard to the authoritarian dictatorial past from which we came. Right. But but the whole issue of corruption, so, so yes, the procedures were in place, and you rightly say that procedures were there, but whether we were able or whether the government was able to achieve it uh, is something that we, we will now discuss. Because, um, you know, as one of our viewers rightly post, posted too, that, you know, the, the issue we can see is that if, regardless of the, look, uh, council, the constitution is there, but yet you may have a government that just refuses to adhere to what you, were, or arguments you would be putting on the constitution matters. So procedures are there, but whether they're being adhered to and what would be done to, to bring the, those, that the, the perpetrators to, to no. answer. No, it's not that it's not that procedures were there. Procedures were put there by the PPP. And I'm yes. saying to you that if the PPP was as corrupt as the perception is, and, the, and to what you have alluded to, mm -hmm. if the PPP was interested in so much corruption, then it would never have made the changes that it put into place by law, by institution and by so many other policies to, to stamp out corruption. So that, that, that reality must be recognized. Well, yes, um, and, and that's, where, that's where I want us to take this discussion now. So, so the procedures were there, and, and uh, you know, you were saying that uh, the, the PPP therefore, by institutionalizing these procedures, by having it in place, you know, the incentive or whatever it is to, to be corrupt then should not exist. But then we have had so many accusations, and I want to put some of them in front of you for you to take on. Yes. Let's, let's, let's talk about a couple of them. One would be the Lethem Fiber Optic Cable Project. Another would be the specialty hospital. Let's talk about those two for a minute. All right, Let, let's deal with the specialty hospital. Uh -huh. Let, let's deal with the specialty hospital. Now, that is a project that was financed by the Indian Exim Bank. A great project on paper. The Guyanese people want that. They need that project. In fact, we still need it now, perhaps more than ever. So, you know, Yo, that that was a project that was going to be financed by the Indian Exim Bank. You know the procedure and the conditionality is to acquire such financing. You know that it involves us accepting a short listing of contractors approved by the bank and by the Indian government. And those shortlisted contractors must then compete in accordance with our local uh, procurement uh, procedure and laws in order to win the contract. You know that that is how it is done. Correct. Those procedures, Yog, were faithfully followed. And Surendra Engineering was, was a product of that process. Now tell me, what can the government do if that is what the, a listing came from India? Surendra was selected and part of that listing. Surendra competed here in accordance with our local uh, procurement procedures and the evaluation process, the procurement process, run not by government, run by public officers, run by assessed by public servants, it produced surrender. Right? Surrender was given the contract. Now we were in, we were looking on, the contract timelines were not being met. And that first raised some red herrings. And then the government, our government, started to bring surrender in and start to ask questions. And then we discovered that the bond that surrender had put up was not a valid one. And it is us who terminated the contract and we blacklisted surrender from leaving the jurisdiction of Guyana. It was I, as Attorney General, that sued um, Surendra in our local courts to recover the money's pain. It was I, who was Attorney General, who issued directions to the head of the Presidential Secretariat, to the GRA, 
to detain all surrenders imports that he had at the war. Tons and tons of steel. And we took them and we stored them in the Ministry of Health compound so that when we got our judgment, we would have been able to recoup. By that time, the government changed. And it was this government that handed those containers of steel to Brian Tiwari, BK International, for zero at the expense of the state. So I'm glad that you choose that contract. So let me get the other contract that you, you want me to talk about. So, so let's 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 deliberate because I remember uh, and I have in in front of me one of the newspaper clippings that spoke to to the the big opposition uh, that you had then with the with the specialty hospital because I think uh, you know based on the corruption and 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 if you don't mind let us just segue a little bit off Devin you could pose that corruption index um, thing there because. Oh. And, on, undoubtedly, the the the, the corruption uh, the corruption's perception index of the PPP's term in office was higher than than it has been since then. Oh, uh, I am dealing. With you listen. I forget one other component. Mm -hmm. When this government got into power, though they give away the steel, in addition to giving away the steel that we had kept and detained for the purpose of levying on, they gave the contract, remember? They went and they awarded, handed that contract without no award to Federal Lloyd, a known man, known company associated with Ramjetan. And then it turned out subsequently that Federal Lloyd was blacklisted by the IDB for corruption. That was the ground that it was a corrupt organization. And then the project was scrapped. I am glad I remember that final installment. Yeah. So, yo, I, 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 I live the corrupt, the index thing, man. I know all of that, the perception and so on. I am telling you, you see, yo, freedom, what the PVP guaranteed to the people of this country was freedom, right? So, newspapers and journalists, in my view, abuse that freedom. So, you used to have a daily a daily outpouring of outrageous stories, one after the other. But you would, admit, you would admit that as long as something enters public domain and it goes unchallenged, it then becomes part of, of, of the, the general knowledge of people. And, and so this is why, I mean, we have tonight so that we could challenge some of these things. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the lithium fiber optic cable project, because that is something. And again, I, I, I'm appreciative of what you say without me commenting on it, because, you know, you are the lawyer here. And, and I'm not so sure, um, you know, our legal stands. But, uh, you know, what the, happens? The is that I don't I don't know much about that project. You OK, I don't know much about that project. But let us give me another project that, that okay. was put out there. As corruption. Okay. Now, Amila Falls? Let us yeah. go. With you. Amila, let's, right. let's, let's go to the Amila Falls. Good. Amila Falls. So you had the Amila Falls project. It would not have cost the treasury of this country a single cent, you know. Right? The road, all we had to do was to build the road. That was all we had to do. So we went to public tendering again. That part, that phase was going to be done by Guyanese and, and found funded by Guyanese. That was phase one of the project, the road. We went to public tender. You had um, BK International tendering and you had, I think, two Chinese companies. The two Chinese companies came in at 20, BK, I think, came in at 21 million. The two Chinese companies, one came at 24 million US and the other one at 28 million. This man, um, the other company that got the contract, came in at 16 million or something like that. Fip Motila. Fip Motila. Now, imagine had we given that, so Fip coming 6 million lower than the second, which was BK International. And then BK coming 4 million lower than the, Chinese, the first Chinese. And then there was a second Chinese that came in at 28 million or something like that, or 31 million. Had we given that contract to Brian Tiwari, we would have been caused down as corrupt and ignoring Fip Motila. Had we given it to the Chinese, we would have been caused down as giving it to a high, such a high bidder 
when you had a man bidding at 14 million. You, you understand the predicament that you're in? And government didn't make that decision, you. The procurement authority made that decision. So that was the road contract. So, yes. so, so the, the, but, but there is another component to the, to the Amila Falls thing where, where there is a general belief. I believe I had written an article on it too, where the cost of production of electricity was seen to be exorbitantly high compared to similar projects across the world. That, that, that is not true. That is not true. And perhaps our problem in government had always been that we were not doing the appropriate and proper PR work. Now, <clears throat> Blackstone was one of the largest multinational doing hydro projects in the world. And you, you are a finance man. You are well educated and experienced in that field. And you know that a company of the stature of a Blackstone will not come here in Guyana for a tidbit project, because that is what it was. Compared to hydro pro projects in the world, it was one of the smallest. It, was, it would have been the smallest project undertaken by Blackstone. And they would not come here in, 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 in the bushes of Guyana to solid their international reputation. They did an examination of the project and they felt that it was feasible. All that they asked for was that we must guarantee, well, they were entering into a power purchase agreement with GPL, right? That GPL will, produce, will buy all the power that they produce. So we were getting that done. But all they were asking for is for us to guarantee mm -hmm. that in the event that GPL doesn't buy the power from them, then the government will pay for it. It was a guarantee. We were not spending a cent, you and today we would have been getting, getting electricity from that project at a fraction of what we are taking it now. We would have, by now it would have been about 14 cents. Right. 14 cents per kilowatt. Now we are paying 45 cents or more per kilowatt. Oh. The point I am making to you, and it would not have cost a dollar to the treasury, but the thing was spun by the press and by the opposition because... They wanted to vote the project down. They were playing politics with all the major projects. We couldn't get anything off the ground. Look at this one, Bastille Williams. This guy voted down all the legislation that we had to pass to make us compliant with our international obligation uh, internationally under the AML CFT regime. You know that. Every single guy in this, you could read and write knows that. And this man is telling the Washington Post with a straight face that he had to take Guyana out of blacklisting. He put Guyana into blacklisting in the first place. This, every time that guy speaks is distortions and lies. Look at the, look at the judgment. Let me give you another example of, of, of corruption. Rudisa judgment. We had to pass a law <clears throat> to amend our Customs Act, to remove an environmental tax from the, the beverage. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, they were a CARICOM producing country and they were not to enjoy any um, disincentives. And that tax was deemed to be a disincentive by the CARICOM tribunal. So the matter was already decided. It was a fait accompli when it came to the government of Guyana. We took the bill. The Suriname people took us to court. At the treaty level, they wanted 16 million US from us because that's the money that we collected unlawfully in breach of that law. The lawyers and the owner of the company made contact with me and said, look, we don't want a problem with Guyana. Just pass this law. We will withdraw our lawsuit. We wipe the slate clean and we proceed as normal. You keep the 16 million US. We don't want it. So no cost to the government of Guyana? No Guyan. cost to the government. None. I went to the parliament and I explained that to them and I said, look, the case is adjourned in the CCG for me to pass this law. They voted it down. I went back to the CCG. I begged and I got an adjournment and actually sing table the law a second time in the parliament and again, they voted it down. Mm -hmm. And now when the judgment is awarded and for pay the judgment, Marcel Williams goes around the world and says, look at what the PVP has done.
But let me tell you where the wickedness is, you and where the corruption is. In the witness box, remember, it's a trial we are having at the treaty level of the court, not at the appellate level. So we had to do a trial at the CCJ. I cross-examined the CEO of that beverage company. And in order for him to show, you remember, he had to prove that he was suffering a disadvantage. Yes. But I was able to get from him that progressively all his sales were increasing in Diana and he was making a profit. Although he's competing with banks, the IH and the EDL. So something is amiss. What is it? Because your sales are increasing, your profit increasing, but yet you're saying that you're suffering at a disadvantage. So then he had to concede that they were bearing the loss in Suriname by under-invoicing the, the, the drink at the border when they were bringing it into Guyana. So what that means is that the transaction value declared on the product was not the real transaction value. Right, right. So net net they would have... You understand? So in other words, they were paying short taxes to Guyana based upon at volume value. You understand? Yes. So I then, when the, when the case was finished, I cabinet advised the then CG, Commissioner General, to audit every single bottle that they imported. And the taxes you that they would have owed Guyana would have far exceeded 16 million US dollars. Mm -hmm. And when, when, they, when they saw that we were going in that direction, the company said, look, let, we don't do the audit. We, don't, we are not going to enforce the judgment. Let us just we proceed as normal. You have passed the law and we are happy. Right. That is when government changed. <clears throat> that was the position that we had. Do you know that this government went and paid 16 million US? And when you found out why, we were told that these were um, campaign promises made during the campaign. And if you look at the cars that they were driving mm -hmm. during that period, and who is the distributor of those cars, then you, you conclude, you draw the conclusion. Let me give you BK International and Hat Bosch. There's another one. I terminated as attorney general. We had several meetings with the contractor. He was not discharging his obligation under his contract. So the contract provided for termination. We terminated, we served. BK International a notice to remove his equipment from the, the site and we indicated to them him that we will sue for breach of contract. Government change. BK International get a lawyer to write one letter and this government paid BK compensation in the sum of 5.6 million US dollars. BK, we were going to sue BK for breach of contract. With a mere letter, not even going to court, BK International was paid compensation for a contract that he breached 5.6 million US. And Bastille Williams talking about corruption to Washington Post. Let, let's, let's, let's segue, let's, let's take a pause there for a couple of seconds. Now, there, there are a number of other issues that are of concern to the public. Uh, that relates to, to, to corruption under the PPP. I mean, I will just call a list out. You pick which one you want to deal with. There is, there is the matter of, of the land grab at Pradoville too. There is the Sonata Textiles land deal. There is well, the... No, 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 but you see, we go in. What is, what is the deal? You see, you have this list that everybody is reciting. Correct. And it's so, not ingrained. What is the thing with Sonata Textiles? Well, they're saying that there was a special deal made to, to the owners of Queens Atlantic because they were friends with the, with the former president. Uh, look, I have looked at the Sonata Textile. I went to visit that place when it was advertised. Mm -hmm. That place was a cow pasture. In fact, I believe that Queen Atlantic overpaid for that property. They overpaid for that property. That is why three valuations were done. Three valuations were done. You know what the government value that property as a government valuation, I think it was 250 million. And you know how much Queen's Atlantic paid? 750 million. So you so see these things, yo, that thing went, them, yeah, because this is why we have tonight. That thing went to tender, you know how many times? Mm -hmm. And nobody was buying it. It was removed because it was a cow pasture flooded with mud. But because Bobby Ramlu bought it, and Bobby Ramroop has some association with people in the PUP, or Jack Day in particular, it became a scandal.
Right. Now, there's another issue I want us to address, and it, it's something that probably might get you off, because there is there is a matter of the state media and media in general. Now, under the PPP's governance, there was the withholding of advertisements from, from a number of newspapers. We have seen it happen under this current government. I think that uh, many persons in the PPP have felt that the, the media has always been a bane to the existence of the PPP um, from, from its history. Um, so let's talk a little bit because one of the things that I certainly feel that, that you fail badly at while in government was to liberalize the state media was to open up even though there was that ncn fraud and all of those things and today the same state state media that the pnc and afc promised to liberalize and to open up it's it's now biting you in the in, in the in the bottom so let's talk a little bit about state media and and the advertisements and withholding of of, of, of ads and so forth first of all under the pvp government we had a proliferation of about 30 television stations right across the length and breadth of this country. You recognize that, right? Yes. They all started under the PUP. Right. So but, there was also, but there was also the, the accusation of cronyism for the radio license, right? Don't forget that. No, no, we'll get to that. So let me yeah. do it you know, Correct. TV. So we started that. Mm -hmm. Under the PUP, two more newspapers came. So out of the four newspapers in the country, two came under the PUP. For television, every single television station came under the PUP. For radio, how much? 12 or 13 radio stations, licenses, were granted under the PUP. Yet we are accusing of stifling the media. How many TV licenses were granted under this government? How many radio licenses were granted under this government? Well, you, know, well, you see, that is a, that's why I don't want to deal with perception. No, I but deal with facts. if you give away, you give away, give away most of the frequencies, nothing is left. No, no, but let us deal with the radio. That's not true, yeah. man. Yeah. Yeah, let's deal with the radio. Yes. We had, you look at the radio station and look at how the matter was put, projected out there by, by, by certain media houses. You had a man from Linden who got a radio license. You had a wireless international who got a radio license. You have another gentleman from Borbis who got a radio license. You got Alfonso who got a radio license. You got a man from Le Rupununi who got a radio license. But you're not hearing about them. You know, you're not hearing, but you're hearing about Passad, and you're hearing about Vishuk, and you're hearing about Bobby. Uh, you understand what I'm telling you? Yes. So that is, that is what I'm talking about. That is not press reporting. That is malicious use of the press oh. so they put they put six hold on they put six indian photographs when they talk about radio license so you put they put siraj they put anand they put vish vishuk and they put somebody here robert Prasad. Mm -hmm. but they don't put only f seven non-indians got radio station yeah seven and five indo guys get but whenever the radio station thing was reported only five indo guys photographs Plastered and the, the got you with, I got that's you with, talking about you. That's, that's right. I got your point there. But let's let's deliberate a little bit more on this council. Now, those that got, that were seen to be closely associated to the government, closely associated, whether they were deserving or not, they got a radio license. Uh, was it then, is it wrong for the public to then feel you have benefited your friends and families in the process? <clears throat> but, Yog, if I am a Guyanese and my brother, and I am Anil Nandlala, I'm attorney general, my brother is a Guyanese because he's my brother, he should suffer a disability? I don't believe in that. If his brother is the attorney general and he gets something from the government because his brother is the attorney general, that is wrong. If he gets it because he's qualified for it as a guy is, that is right. That is his entitlement. But who you makes the me, call? Who makes that call? Because what? All right. Tell me. You have, the, process. You have become your own police in the process. No, 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 man. The license was given by a broadcasting authority. But what, what? Who? got it under the PVP, who should not get it? Tell me. I am not going to call any names, but what I'm saying is, is that those who are associated with the PVP. Yes. Yeah, let us go through them. 
Did Alan Passad of MTN not entitled to it? Did Vishuk Passad of E Networks not entitled to it? Did Channel 65 not entitled to it? Did the Mirror newspaper, is the Mirror newspaper or the PPP not entitled to it? Now, if the PNC wants to apply, then they can apply. If we gave the PNC PPP and we did not give the PNC, that was wrong. But you can't fault a man who is qualified for getting what he's entitled to. Mm. The, law, the law doesn't work like that. You got to show me that these people are disqualified. Should we have given more? Well, perhaps. But were there more applications? You know, all of the people who complained, they did not have an application pending. That, that is not true, Council. I know of people who at have applied and had applications pending. No, no, no. At the time when applications were invited, Vera, for example, claimed he had an application 20 years ago. He was written to, to apply and he did not apply. So the process, I'm not, I am just telling you what the facts are, brother. I had nothing to do with the grant of the, with the licenses. Understood. Right? But I am just telling you how these things can be twisted. Understood. And that is what purposes. Purposes. Yes. And in Guyana, necessarily for ethnic purposes. Yes. Let, let's take a quick minute break and um, a little water break. And then we come back and we'll talk about what has happened from then to now. And we address the third section of tonight's program. I'm losing my voice now, eh? I recognize the book that. launch of Jung Bahadur Singh of Guyana by Dr. Beitar Amramrak will be held on Saturday, November 23rd at 5 p.m. at Tulsi Mandir. This book dives into the life of Jung Bahadur Singh, a prominent leader and mediator who assisted the sugar workers in their dispute with management. This book would examine the legacy of Jung Bahadur Singh as well as his contentious relationship with Chetty Jagan. Support the book launch on Saturday, November 23rd at 5 p.m. at 10324 111th Street, Richmond Hill, New York. Again, that's Saturday, November 23rd at 5 p.m. at Tusi Mandir. Thank you. Let's, Council, let's, let's address corruption again and let's talk about uh, you are now on the outside and, and, and politics aside, you are also a citizen of Guyana that's looking and seeing what's going on in government. While you have a, the mantle of a politician, which I presume you cannot separate yourself from, um, you would ne nevertheless see things from the lens of an ordinary citizen as well as from that of a former attorney general and know what is legal and not legal. One of the problems I personally have with you politicians in Guyana, and I'll say this with great respect to you, sir, is that not there, there are very, very few instances anymore where morality matters. Everybody just say, is it legally wrong? And nobody's asking, is it morally wrong? However, that aside, let's now go into the next segment of our show and let's discuss a little bit of from 2015 to now, because the current government made a lot of promises and they paraded a lot of the PPP. Uh, and this is probably the, the bane to their current existence because they paraded a lot of the PPP persons in front of the courts, in front of Soku and Sarah and so forth, um, in, in, in an effort to, to have prosecution brought, well, bring them to court. That has all apparently failed. But who's better to speak at it than, than you? Because you would have been one of the, the attorneys and the counsels uh, appearing with all of your clients. But let's talk about corruption from 2015 to now. And mind no, you, I, I, mind, mind you I'm, I've asked the government to appear on next week's show to talk about the same matters. I, I'm going to, I, have, I always put facts out. I don't involve in rhetoric and, and um, propaganda. So firstly, their increase in salary. They, you remember, secretly gave to themselves this 50 to 100 percent increase in salary and lied about it. Mr. Raphael Trotman came out and said that it is not true when the media leaked it. And then we found it in a very inconspicuous place in the official gazette because by law they have to put an order out there increasing their salary. And only then did we know that they, were, they had increased their salary by 100%. And, and but dating it, making it retrospective to the first day of July, it means that their worst working day, they took from the Treasury double what the PUP ministers were taking. And there were about 50 more ministers. So, in a nutshell, 
You know, the, the thing goes with pension. And you know the controversy and the hurricane that they created with Barra Jack Dale's pension. Correct. So immediately, without doing a day's work, Moses Nagamotu, for example, would be, have been entitled to the same pension that Barra Jack Dale is entitled to. Without doing a day's work on the 1st of July, 2015. And this man, Moses Nagamotu, and all of them, but him in particular, jump on every house stop in this country, costing Jack Dale about his pension. But Jack Dave was, Isn't it the same Moses was on record as saying he would refuse any, any increase in salary? This is yes. Okay. He said, when, he said when Jack Dale pension bill was being passed, it rattled his soul. Remember? And I saw, I, I produced a hand sign to show that he voted in favor of it. He voted in favor of it. But this guy, at least Jack Dave would have worked for 12 years as president. This guy did not work 12 hours. And he got the same pension that he used to cause Jack Dave about. So right there, from the first day, you, the corruption began. The first day, the first working day of this government was the 1st of July. Because remember, the, the, um, was May was election. After the swearing, they had big sport out at the stadium, big sport out at the Pegasus and so on. They sported for about a week before they get down to work. Nobody know the millions that spend them. So the corruption started from the very hour that they go in office. But from the first working day, they took from the treasury in that increase in salary. Then the Dorman Park scandal. Up to now, up to now, the Auditor General is saying that $600 million is missing. That project started, according to them, that it will be lovers of Guyana who will be donating Party supporters will be donating. They form a private company out of the office of the president with advisors of the president and I believe Minister Rupert Rupnarayan as directors and shareholders. And they took charge of the project. I have never heard anything like that in my life. No accountability, nothing. And then Minister Patterson confessed that he had to put $150 million dollars of his ministry money into the project. And then he came back to the parliament for another 550 million. That's what, up to now, we don't know how much that project cost and who donated what and who has not donated. But and that project has never been, it has been audited and 600 million can be formed. So that is the next, that is the next big thing. The other one is um, the drug bond. You spoke about it earlier. Twelve and a half million dollars being paid to a member of the party to rent a house in our boys town, which we discovered were only was only storing condoms and lubricants. You know the story well. For a three year period, twelve million five hundred thousand plus what? Per year? Per month. Per month, year. sorry. Yes, 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 I remember that. 60,000 US per month for a house in Alboy's town. A house that could have rent for 15,000 for a three year period, and they pay that in full. And they advance, they give the man mon enough money in advance for the contract. Then the man won't buy the building. The man bought the building for 20 million Guyana dollars and the first month rent was 12 million 500 thousand. Is the rent, the security deposit, the two months rent in advance and security deposit caused the man to buy the building in the first place. That got corruption from the beginning to the end. And multiply that for three years, 12 million a month. Then I spoke about the Rhodesia case. Then you have the billions of dollars of write-offs by GRA of certain companies who I'm told finance campaign, right? You have that. Then you have the $5 million shares. You, you are a GTNT. You know that the shares, $5 million is missing for the sale of the shares from the Chinese company. Mr. Harmon went to China, came back and said that the monies were paid. 
And when we said that the money was not paid, then he agreed that the money was not paid. Where is that 5 million US? Where is that 5 million US? It can't be found up to now. Then, of course, we have the signing bonus that they hid. $17 million. Where is that money? Nobody knows where the money is. We were told that $3 million will be used to pay for the cost of going to the World Court. $15 million. Nobody is not in the Treasury. It's not in the Central Bank anymore. We were told that the Minister of Finance invested. We don't know where. It's not part of the accounting structure of this country. It's not reflected in our bank books, in our balances. So they can keep it out there and spend it and we wouldn't know. All right? Where also is the 150 million US or 30 billion that was borrowed for Kaisuku? Where is that money? Nobody knows where that money is. 30 billion dollars gone. The Minister of Agriculture is on record as saying that he doesn't, he doesn't even know why the money was borrowed. He doesn't know where the money is. We are paying you millions and millions of dollars of interest per day on 30 billion. And we don't know where the money is. But, but, but hold on. But, but you have been in Parliament. And uh, am, I, am I missing something here? Would, would your, would your uh, finance um, guy, representative in Parliament, who I believe uh, is Irfan er Ali, um, would he not have questioned uh, where where are these sums and, and, and show to, to, to bring them in front of Parliament? Yeah, we have questioned it over and over. You don't get, this is the first time that we have asked, uh, that questions are being asked in the Parliament and they are not either answered or they are, or they are answered with, with, with uh, fabricated answers. They lie to us in the Parliament. They lie to us about where these monies are. Look at, of course, the mother of all scandals and, and con is the, 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 the oil contract. Not a single tax, not a single taxation applies to that contract. They, they pay no VAT, they pay no duty, they pay no excise tax, they pay no corporate tax, they pay no income tax, nothing. And you know what the contract says? Save and accept. If a Guyanese is employed, he shall be subject to income tax law. Could you believe that vulgarity? That is in the Exxon Mobil contract. Yeah. And we have to give them you six months notice before we can visit the rig and visit their operation out there. Six months notice in writing. And then when we do it, they tell us that we can't ask for certain type of information and certain data are inaccessible. But on that point, let me let me just ask this. On that point, isn't the opposition leader on record saying he's not uh, keen on renegotiating these oil contracts? No, 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 no. The opposition leader didn't say so. A newspaper, <clears throat> a newspaper said that the opposition leader said so. Okay. Then you have the GPC scandal with the drugs and Ansem McCall. Some 750 million drugs, dollars in drugs, just ordered by the minister, walking into the public hospital as though it's a cake shop and instructing them to buy goods <coughs> from Ansa Makal, buy our drugs from Ansa Makal, 750 million dollar worth. Complete disregard of the Public Procurement Act. Even the Procurement Tribunal found that contract. That, that to be um, illegal and an unlawful subversion of the act, um, which is another one I can deal with. There are so many. Well, that, well there, was, there was this one that straddled both governments, and both PBP and the current government has been accused of corruption under the airport contracts. Let's talk about that a little bit. No, no. My understanding is the PPP negotiated a fixed turnkey type contract. Okay. As I understand it, it was a fixed price and you delivered to me an airport in accordance with these drawings. So much square foot, that is the length of the driveway, everything was specified and it was that type of contract. Not some, if any variation was supposed to be borne by the contractor. 
It was that kind of contract. Patterson went, this government went, and they renegotiated. And there is evidence before the renegotiation began. In fact, while we were in government, a team from the same company took a few ministers now, or one minister, powerful man, who was then in the opposition, to Montego Bay, and certain things were worked out. Jamaica. And anyhow, the contract was negotiated, renegotiated by Minister Patterson. All right? And we ended up with a smaller contract at a larger price. That is the sum total. That is the story of the airport. Mm -hmm. A smaller contract at a larger price. That is what they negotiated. Look at Mr. Justice, uh, Mr. Patterson. Minister Patterson. Bringing a proposal to cabinet to single source the feasibility study for the bridge at 169 million single source of policy he identifies persuades cabinet to grant it so the Tory procurement process out cabinet granted this contract Patterson then goes to the Demerara Harbor Bridge limited a company governed by a board of directors and instructs the CEO to go into the company account and give him $169 million to pay this contractor. Yo, these are more, most, these are some of the most vulgar examples and manifestations of corruption so, anywhere so, on planet so, Earth. So on this, on this note, let me address you as counsel. As, as a senior man in the legal fraternity. My brother, what does the grassroots of Guyana, what comfort do we have that, that our, our laws and procedures can be, can be broken by any politician willy-nilly? Um, what assurance we have that the future will be taken care of can, can we as private citizens start taking more uh, litigation, litigious action against government ministers and so forth on these on these notes? Well, I, the citizenry always, you see, a, a, citizen, a, a citizenry gets a government that it deserves, you know. There is an old saying to that effect and it Correct. has great wisdom. Correct. So, you, you, you know, in Diana, unfortunately, you have this ethnic political problem that is killing the minds, the intellect, the objectivity of the Guyanese, the average Guyanese. Mm -hmm. We are being overtaken by emotions, by ethnic prejudices, by political sycophancy and our objectivity educated as we are, are lost. So we become a part of the flock. All right? And, and I think, yeah, yeah, correct. But I mentioned, I mentioned that. Yes, go on. That has become institutionalized so that even the organizations and institutions that are supposed to be holding the balances mm -hmm. and supposed to be the checks to keep the politicians intact are afflicted with the same issues and problems. Correct. So they see society and they see the situation mm -hmm. through the same discolored lens. Mm -hmm. Correct. That's why you, you go, you, you look at the judiciary and you see certain rulings that is that are hard to reconcile with rationality and principles of law. Correct. So, so, then, yeah, so I, get, I get your point, right? I mean, we're, we're coming to the, to the end of program time, but I get your point on that. Now, here, here is something I'd like, uh, you know, I'd like to reach out to our viewers across this country and across the, 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 the diaspora. I mean, look, n next year, March is going to be, hopefully, general elections. Um, I, I think for me personally, Council, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, until I see Parliament dissolve, I don't know that there will be elections. 
But before I ask you to answer on that one, um, I would like to call upon the citizens of Guyana. You know what? It is time we, the people, the first words of our constitution, we, the people, take control of this country and don't let the politicians abuse our taxes, make themselves happy with everything and leave the people with nothing. One in every three Guyanese is, is living in poverty. And we cannot, and we are not going to allow the next government or even this government to continue along this line and go unchecked. Now, Councillor, what I'd like to ask you in, in, as, we, as we wrap up our program, given all this constitutional crisis, I know this is your forte, I'm not going to invite you to speak on it, but given all the constitutional crisis, my question to you, given all the history we have had, Guyana's first internationally monitored elections was in 1992, so much years after, after independence. Two things I, I put to you. One, would the PPP guarantee this, the, the citizenry of this country that all those wrongdoings that you have identified here will be investigated and will be dealt with? if you are to get into power. And two, give us a little bit, uh, as quickly as you can, um, am I right in my assessment that unless, unless I see Parliament dissolve, I don't know that there'll be elections? All right. Your, let me start with a little before your question. Yes. Your appeal to Guyanese to take charge of the affairs of the country. Let me add to that appeal, and let me appeal to my brothers and sisters, my Guyanese brothers and sisters, Stop voting race, vote issues. That is my call. And that is where we have to begin. We have to begin. If we continue to vote race, we will self-destruct as a people. So that's my first call. Stop voting race, vote policies, vote principles, vote track record, vote deliverables, vote on those who have a capability and capacity demonstrably to deliver. So that is the first thing. York, as far as possible, first of all, the PVP will not, I, as I, 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 I am speaking here, I am not, um, I don't have the authority to speak on behalf of the entire PVP, but my understanding and my feeling is that the PVP will not want to engage in any kind of witch hunting and political um, vendetta and revenge, that kind of politics. We have never done that and we will never do that. Our task when we get into government is nation building, delivering to the people of this country, protecting the patrimony of this country, its natural resources from those who are likely to exploit it, etc., etc. Our, our priority is the developmental agenda, get that going, that's what. Two but by things. saying that, aren't you saying to those who you have said are breaking every rule in the book, no, 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 I, I, smartly, we are not going to do anything? No, 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 I'm not saying that. I am saying then, so that is the priority. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the wrongs that have been committed will have to be addressed. And it will have to be, I want, you see, governments do not prosecute and investigate offenses. They are agencies of state. Correct. Correct. They will have to do that. And I am assuring you that they will be given the whatever authority they need, whatever resources they need to carry out those investigations, institute charges where charges are required to be instituted based upon those investigations and prosecute those charges to the end, if that is what the law requires. Okay. So it will be a lawfully driven process, but the government will whatever the law permits it to do to ensure that it is done. All right? So it, it is a priority of the government. But we are not going to do what these people are doing, persecuting and the attorney general instructing Soku to charge the former attorney general, that kind of fooling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the state should never instruct uh, any, any arm of the judiciary to take action. I'm sorry, we seem to have lost you a little bit. Um, meanwhile, Council is coming back for us to wrap up tonight's program. Let me quickly say that I'm, I, I would like to really appeal to our, our Guyanese brothers and sisters across this country and in the diaspora. Whatever happens in our next elections, 
whatever happens, whoever is in power, it is time the people of this country get together and realize the power is in our hands. I would like to call on my brothers and sisters, let us change this country, not by depending on the politicians, but by standing up on our two feet and addressing what is wrong, coming out against corruption, regardless of who is in power. I, I, I don't have counsel is back. Are you back, counsel? But meanwhile, he's coming. I, I want to assure everyone that we're going to continue this conversation. We are hoping, we are trying to get a government personnel to appear on our show to not just address what council has said here tonight, but to address this whole aspect of corruption in government. Because we, of, of my personal self, and I'm sure that the Globespan team agrees with me, that Guyanese have to take control of Guyana. 44 years we have allowed politicians and they have failed us almost every time. It is time we take control. We are running out of program time. I am sorry that we cannot get council back on, but I'm sure we can do a similar program or another program in the future. Good night, everyone. Let me thank Globespan team. Let me thank Nohar Singh. Let me thank Devin, Kumar, and all the others who have worked hard to get our program done tonight. And I think we have had a wonderful chat about corruption. Let's move on, Guyana, and let's take this country to, to the place we want it to be. Good night, everyone.